In this week's news, Starbase Starship launches are approved by the FAA, kind of. An odd satellite is being repurposed for geographic positioning and Astra has another failed launch attempt. This is tomorrow's space news. We'll get into the FAA environmental approval in a second, but firstly, Ship 24 cryotested for a third time a week ago on Tuesday. This was followed by the SpaceX LR11000 crane being moved over to the suborbital pad and a lift onto the transport stand. Later on, Ship 24 was rolled down the highway to the production facility for Raptor installation. This is Ship 25, Ship 24's successor, and you can see it just slightly poking around the side of the High Bay 1 entrance. This was followed with a move into the mid bay. Ship 24 wasn't the only thing rolling down the highway last week as the new Edome test tank was transferred the other way from the production site to the launch site. This aft barrel section was seen being rolled into Tent 1, with it being destined for Ship 27. Let's talk about boosters. First up, B7.1. This test tank was lifted up in High Bay 1 during the early hours of Friday, being stacked. We've also received an image from Elon Musk on Twitter of all 33 Raptors finally being installed onto Booster 7. This is really exciting as it means that the first static fire of 33 engines isn't that far away. All we need to wait for now is the gradual tests where SpaceX will fire only a few engines at a time. Ground service equipment is important, especially if it's going to be catching your boosters and ships. The chopsticks were tested again last week and there's a chance it could be used to lift up Booster 7 onto the launch mount. Buildings to build stuff is also important and this is a new building being constructed near the production site. The siding is now being added on, making it look like the new Star Factory building, but we still don't know what it'll be used for. There were some good guesses in the comments last week, but it could literally be used for anything. Now the moment we've all been waiting for, for a while now, the FAA has granted the environmental approval for SpaceX to operate the Starship Super Heavy vehicle out of Starbase. The FAA has issued a mitigated FONSI, which basically means that SpaceX will need to make some minor tweaks to help protect the local environment in order to satisfy the review. Don't get too excited just yet, however, as this isn't the end of the story in terms of both approvals and development. SpaceX doesn't currently have a booster and a ship which are ready to go to space and they still require a launch license. This approval, however, does move us closer to the orbital flight test once SpaceX addresses all of the tasks to minimize the environmental impact. It's progress we should all be super happy to see. If you want more details, the entire PDF is linked below in this episode's footnotes. I'd also highly recommend you go and check out NASA Spaceflight's Roundup videos, which are linked in the corner. There's a 10 minute video and a five hour live stream, both packed with too much information to stick into a sub 20 minute news episode. The Polaris program is a way for SpaceX to test human spaceflight on Starship. However, there's still a little bit away from that goal being achieved. The first Polaris mission, however, Polaris Dawn, has just published an update on the crew's mission status. As you can tell, the Dawn crew have been training, starting with two days of basic medical and scuba training in May. The ways in which divers non-verbally communicate underwater are similar to the ways which astronauts can communicate during a spacewalk if their primary way of communication, their radio, decides to no longer work for whatever reason. The crew also completed multiple high altitude climbs in Ecuador in Central America. The tallest climb was Cotopaxi, the second tallest peak in the country at 5,897 meters. Oh, and it's also an active volcano. In the coming months, the crew will be completing hypoxia and centrifuge exercises, hands-on medical training and crew dragon simulations. I'm also just going to quickly slip in here that CRS-25 has been pushed to no earlier than June 11th as SpaceX have been able to have a deeper look into the Cargo Dragon vehicle. The elevated vapor readings of the monomethyl hydrazine, which were detected earlier this month, has been located to a Draco thrust valve inlet joint. This will now have to be replaced, leading to the large delay. A few weeks back, RCEP, the French telecommunications regulator, had their authorization of Starlink revoked following a ruling from the country's highest administrative court as they did not launch a public consultation before authorizing it. So RCEP launched a public consultation and it was found that there is demand in rural areas. RCEP has now reauthorized Starlink to operate in France. 
Alongside the Starlink approval, France has been in the news in another area this week, the Artemis Accords. These accords are designed to build upon the Outer Space Treaty to ensure that the exploration of the universe is peaceful. The signing ceremony took place to help mark CNES's 60th anniversary, who are the French Space Agency. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and CNES President Philippe Baptiste both signed France's page of the documents. The delay of Psyche's launch from August to September has meant a bit of a change in the schedule for those wanting to cover the launch like myself, more on that later, and a bit of a change in computer code so the software glitch can be rectified. A bigger change has occurred with two other payloads however, as the rideshare small sats have had a change of destination. The original plan was to launch in August and for the Falcon Heavy to send spacecraft Psyche on its way to the metallic asteroid Psyche whilst sending two twin small sats named Janus to two different binary asteroids, 1996 FG3 and 1991 VH. With the change in launch date however, all the bodies in the solar system are going to be in different places, which means that if the satellites go via their original route, the Earth will be in the wrong place for the required gravity assist. However, if Psyche does launch between October 7th and October 10th, then 1996 FG3 could be reached by one of the probes. But of course, the main Psyche mission is the most important, so if it launches outside of those dates, the people behind the Janus mission will just have to suck it up. Multiple asteroids are now under consideration, depending on what day the Falcon Heavy lifts off from LC-39A. No names have been dropped just yet, so we'll just have to wait for a finalised list. If you want to see the best coverage of the two Janus probes and Psyche from Florida in September, then you can help out by heading over to my GoFundMe campaign. I'll be making loads of content about the mission and the area, so if you want your name on that, then consider sharing the link around, contributing a bit of cash or any other way you believe you can help make my coverage the best. That link is on your screen now, it's in the description and it's at the end of the video. At the time of writing, we're well over halfway to the £7,000 goal, so thank you to everyone who has gotten the campaign this far, this quickly. The European Geostationary Navigation Overlay Service is used by countries within the European Union to improve the accuracy of GPS services in Europe. There's also Galileo, Europe's own version of GPS. When the UK voted to leave the EU in 2016, it meant that EGNOS and Galileo would eventually no longer be available to users in Britain, which happened last summer. Introducing Inmarsat, who are repurposing a transponder on the satellite I3F5 for testing a replacement for the EGNOS Safety of Life service, which allows aircraft to make precise approaches into airports without the need of expensive ground-based navigation assists. The UK space-based augmentation system, also known as uks bas will eventually use a signal overlaid on top of the original GPS signal for more accurate positioning, moving from a resolution of a few metres to a few centimetres. Goonhilly Earth Station in Cornwall will provide uplink to I3F5 with the UK-based satellite navigation specialists at GMV NSL decoding that signal into navigational data. Originally, the satellite was launched in 1998 and it was designed for connectivity over the UK and Atlantic region. Inmarsat still have enough fuel on board for these tests though, so they decided to help out the UK government to develop UKS BAS's first phase through to the end of July. This isn't actual footage of the launch as I couldn't find any, so what you're looking at is the footage of the last ever flight of the Ariane 4 in 2003. If you cast your mind back a couple of years, you may remember that the British government bought a stake into OneWeb, one of the main competitors to Starlink business, SpaceX's higher-end service. Their satellites could be useful for navigation as well, with them proposing that current and next-generation satellites could have positioning, navigation and timing services installed. Space traffic time and the first launch to cover is Nilesat 301 which was an extra special candle for my birthday cake. Launching at 2204 coordinated universal time on June the 8th from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape, the Egyptian satellite was sent on its way to a geostationary orbit. Nilesat 301 is a communication satellite providing TV, radio and data transmission for Northern Africa and the Middle East and it will be replacing Nilesat 201 which launched 12 years ago. The first stage supporting this mission, Booster B1062, successfully returned to Earth, landing on the drone ship just to read the instructions. Support ship Bob also collected both of the brand new fairing halves. 
This launch was followed by another from the Cape, Tropics 1 on Astra's Rocket 3. At 17.43 UTC on the 12th of June, all five Delphin engines ignited underneath Launch Vehicle 10 before ascending from Slick 46 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The first stage flight went smoothly, followed by a clean and nominal fairing separation and second stage engine start, but sadly the successes were going to end there. At approximately 6,500 meters per second of velocity, just 1,000 shy of the required orbital velocity, it appears that the engine may have shut down prematurely, leading to the vehicle spinning out of control. There's been no word from Astra as of yet, so stay tuned for that and try not to make too many wild assumptions. This resulted in the loss of the payload, which was two Tropics 3 u CubeSats from NASA. It's a big shame to not see this launch reach its final destination, and I'm genuinely starting to get a little bit concerned about Astra. They have a great team and they have a great rocket, it just seems to not work the majority of the time. The small sat launch market isn't infinite, there's only enough room for a number of companies, and if Astra keeps this unlucky trend up, then there could be a gap for future companies nearing their first launches, such as Relativity and ABL Space Systems and even Firefly to slide into a gap and take customers. The upcoming departures and the second test flight of Neary SpaceX with Starlink 419 on Friday as well as Sarah 1 on Saturday and Global Star 2 FM15 on Sunday. During the members hangout on last week's live show, Jamie created a new membership tier. She hasn't made the slate yet, so here you go Neurostream. Thank you very much for becoming the first Tomorrow Model 33 Plaid Pro Plus citizen of tomorrow. Our other supporter ranks currently range from the Escape Velocity tier to the Ground Support tier, with Orbital and Suborbital in between. You also have the System Support members who don't get their names in the show, however their support is greatly appreciated. Head over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join or just hit that blue join button below to become a member for as little as $1 a month. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to contribute to the Psyche campaign in any way, the link to send over money, the plan and my contact details are all available at the link in the corner of your screen now. If you're new and you want to stay up to date in the world of spaceflight every single week, subscribing will ensure that our videos are in your subscriptions feed and we might just catch your ride the next time you're scrolling through not knowing what to watch. For now, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next week and goodbye.